So good afternoon from San Antonio, Texas, known by many indigenous folks as Yanaguana. My name is Courtney Muma, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Texas Digital Library Consortium's Deputy Director. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar, an introduction to Accessible AV, the first in a new TDL series. Thank you to today's presenters for allowing us to learn from your experience. Today's panelists, panelists are William Hicks, Head of User Interface at the University of North Texas Libraries, Daniel Jacobs, Captioning Service Manager from the University of Texas at Austin, and Emily Vinson, Audiovisual Archivist from the University of Houston Libraries. All three speakers will present before we have our Q&A and discussion session, but please drop your questions into the chat or to the community notes document at any time, and we'll keep track of them until then. If you would prefer to ask your question anonymously, please go ahead and send your question directly to me or to Leah DeForest in chat, and we will anonymize it on your behalf. So Emily will start us off today. So Emily, over to you. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon and welcome to the Introduction to Accessible AV webinar, the first in a series of TDL webinars on increasing access to AV holdings. I'm delighted so many of you were able to join us today. I want to thank the TDL staff, especially Leah DeForce, Courtney Muma, and Christy Park for facilitating the creation of the AV Accessibility Steering Committee and for all the support they are providing for this webinar series. A quick note, all of your presenters today come from large public universities in Texas, and we recognize that not all of you come from higher ed or from Texas. We hope that most part, for the most part, we have generalized the content enough to be applicable to everyone, though a few of the details, such as working with students and specifics of law, may not be universally relevant. In this session, we'll cover what we mean when we say AV accessibility, describe the value of this type of work, define key concepts, describe tools, approaches, and costs, and we'll also share practical advice and first steps to getting started and keeping going. We're packing a lot into a single webinar and anticipate questions. TDL has generously allowed us 90 minutes for this session, and so we'll present for the first hour and then open it up to discussion for the last 30 minutes. We are interested in hearing about your collections, your approaches to accessibility, and the challenges you face. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to ask in the chat. As uh, already mentioned, our TDL colleagues are monitoring it and we'll make note of the questions so that you can address them so that we can address them during the Q&A. And if you'd like to stay anonymous, direct your messages to Courtney or Leah. If questions or comments occur to you later, don't hesitate to reach out via email or you can find some members of the steering committee on the TDL Slack channel. There's a community notes document where you will find lots of great links for further reading and can also feel free to contribute there. Leah is sharing all of those in the chat. Additionally, TDL will make this presentation slides and video available in the next few days. As a reminder, keep an eye out for an announcement about the next webinar in this series, which will take place in two weeks on Wednesday, April 13th from 1 to 2.30, where we will feature a variety of case studies from the field. This webinar is focused primarily on the digital library space. This includes a variety of self-hosted repositories, such as DSpace, ContentDM, Avalon, or in-house solutions. The concepts will also apply to those institutions that utilize platforms like YouTube, Vimeo, or SoundCloud to host collections. While there may be some overlap, we won't specifically address AV content posted on social media networks, on library websites or catalogs, on Canvas or Blackboard, or audiovisual objects accessed through subscription databases. And now that we know where we're talking about, let's define what we are talking about. This webinar series is limited to the formats most likely to be found in digital library collections, including only pre-recorded videos like MP4s and MOVs and sound recordings such as MP3s or WAVs. Not included in this presentation are other time-based formats such as live broadcasts or video games. Also not included are st static formats such as photos, PDFs, or presentation slides. AV accessibility encompasses a number of accommodation approaches to address different audiences' needs. This presentation will introduce a variety of AV accommodation practices with a deep dive into the nuts and bolts of transcripts and captions. You'll hear these two terms a lot, and at times they may seem almost interchangeable, but they are not. Transcription is the process, either by human or machine, of converting sound to text. Ideally, this includes capturing both spoken word and nonverbal sounds, such as music or sound effects. 
For audio only recordings, the resulting transcript is usually the product. The transcript can include timestamps, but conventions for timestamp frequency vary. The transcript can appear as a document associated with an audio object, as seen on this slide, which shows a recorded interview and transcript from the Library of Congress's digital collections, or the transcript may be copied and pasted into a description field on a digital library platform. If you have content platforms such as Aviaria or the Oral History Media Synchronizer OMS, there's a possibility of syncing audio and transcripts, which allows a user to search the transcript text and jump to that point in the audio with just a mouse click. Links with examples of those platforms will be shared in the chat and are in the share notes document. For video content, closed captions are created when the transcript is synced very precisely to the video. Specialized closed caption file formats, WebVTT or SRT, are then uploaded alongside the video file in a player, allowing small chunks of text to appear on the video. This slide shows a VTT file on the right and the corresponding video still ca with captions on the left. My co-presenter will introduce some additional reading mediations, like audio descriptions, defined as the verbal depiction of key visual elements in media. Like other approaches that will be touched on, audio descriptions provide a necessary access point to a recording. Unfortunately, the reality is that many, if not most of us, struggle to even address captioning needs, which are comparatively less expensive to produce and technically easier to implement than other accommodations for AV materials. That said, we are pointing to some resources for practices beyond just transcripts and captions. There will be links in the chat and community note document, and we welcome you to share any experiences you've had working to create access beyond transcripts and captions, either in the community notes document or during the Q&A. Before we continue, take a moment to think about how much AV content is on your institution's digital library. We're going to post a short anonymous survey. Courtney, I'll hand it over to you. Alrighty, folks. Everybody loves the survey, right? So this survey is asking you how many hours of AV are in your collection. And you should see it now. Um, I'm going to give us about 45 seconds to get responses to this. Y'all are fast. This is great. I love watching the numbers go up as you start reporting. And I'm looking like a thousand plus is coming out in advance. This is amazing. I've got 49. We're getting there, y'all. I'm going to give us 10 more seconds. All righty, thank you all so much for participating. I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and I'm gonna share the results here. And it looks uh, as suspected, uh, the thousand plus hours uh, is our winner. <laughs> um, some of you were not sure, that's kind of the second there. Uh, then we're kind of tied, we're pretty close there between 50 to 250 and 251 to 1000. Um, and some of you lucky folks with none, maybe, unless you don't consider that luck. So I'll go ahead and hand back now to Emily. Great, thank you. Um, wow, so yeah, absolutely. Now that you've considered how much you have currently, which for a lot of you is a significant amount, uh, consider what your answer might be next year or in five or 10 years. Speaking for my institution, I can say that right now we're in that $1,000 no, 1, hour category, but thanks to a grant funded project, I expect that number of hours in our AV of AV on our digital library to more than double in the next year. And I expect others might be preparing for significant growth in their collections too. And now that you have in mind how much AV you have and are thinking about how much you might have over the coming years, consider how much of that AV is accessible. If your answer is not a lot, you aren't alone. I'm hopeful that in the not too distant future, ensuring accessibility for AV will be baked into the process. Just as it has become standard practice for many working in digital libraries to process PDFs for OCR, making them text searchable. However, at the moment, my perception is that transcription and captioning at scale are still very far from standard practice. This work represents a major resource commitment, both in terms of money and time. So it is worth discussing the value of AV accessibility. Understanding the many ways value is added through accessibility will help you to make the case to administrators for investing in accessible AV 
and communicate the importance of this work to the staff tasked with the tedious process of creating or QCing transcripts and captions. The first question to ask when considering the value of AV accessibility is who benefits? The short answer to this question is everyone. Though captions are often associated with people who are deaf or hard of hearing, in reality, there are a vast number of audiences who benefit from captions or transcripts. In 2015 art journal article, professor of psychology, Dr. Morton N. Gernsbacher noted that captions are a prime example of universal design. Like curb cuts and elevators, she says, captions were initially developed for persons with disabilities. And like curb cuts and elevators, captions benefit persons with and without disabilities. Indeed, the overwhelmingly vast majority of persons who benefit from curb cuts and elevators are not persons with disabilities. And the same could be true for captions. At its core, the idea of universal design champions, sorry, at the core, the idea of universal design champions design that can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their ability or disability. It is an elegant idea, and I think one at the heart of both digital libraries in general and these accessibility efforts in particular. I wanna highlight some specific audiences that benefit from captions or transcripts, though to be sure this is not an exhaustive accounting. In addition to those who are deaf or hard of hearing, other audiences who benefit from accessible AV include individuals who experience auditory processing or other neurological differences, those with cognitive impairments or learning retention difficulties. This might include folks with ADD, ADHD, or those on the autism spectrum. Research indicates that numerous audiences who don't identify as having a disability also utilize captions, including those learning English or learning to read. Many caption users just want to comprehend the content they are consuming better. It can be as simple as someone trying to access a recording in a loud space, or who finds it easier to read unfamiliar or technical terms while listening. In her 2016 study of closed captions used by college students, Dr. Katie Linder found that over half of the 2000 students surveyed are using closed captions in their educational videos some of the time. The study further indicated that students not reporting disabilities use captions almost as frequently as students reporting disabilities. Linder found that study respondents expressed strong agreement that captions help the students focus, retain information, and overcome poor audio. In addition to those already mentioned, other groups more closely aligned with higher education, such as researchers, benefit from accessible AV. Creating searchable transcripts allows researchers to conduct keyword searches on time-based media. Descriptive practices vary, but if we return to that audio transcript example from the Library of Congress I mentioned earlier, the enormous potential of searching transcripts is clear. In the descriptive metadata of that record, there are two contributor names and 18 subject headings. Words in the subject headings occasionally repeat, meaning that this record so description contains 47 unique words. The transcript of this 29 minute recording contains over 5,100 words with 727 unique words. There are also new avenues of digital humanities research opened up through this process. Suppose an institution opts to make the transcript text files available as a data set. This cre would create the opportunity for researchers to conduct computational analysis on large bodies of audiovisual materials. This kind of AV collections as data analysis may be a little hard to conceptualize. So take a look at this example, using the programming language R to text my nine seasons of the US sitcom, The Office by data analyst, Jenna Allen. Here, Allen has used natural language processing analysis of 18 office characters to visualize the frequency of unique words by each character. And here, Allen has used the unique word frequency data to determine which character pairs have the most and least correlated vocabularies, with Dwight and Pam having the most similar and Jan and Daryl the least. While analysis of the office might not be quote unquote serious research, this approach can be used in all sorts of audiovisual data sets, including those in our own collections and lead to exciting discoveries. Excuse me. Beyond the ethical and imperative and the evidence that all audiences benefit from this type of work, there is the additional value of improving accessibility, the business case. First, and probably one at the front of many people's mind, is the importance of minimizing legal risk. Later in this presentation, William will provide a basic primer on some of the laws related to AV accessibility. 
Next, these accessibility efforts have the potential to create efficiency in our internal work pro processes. In the same way researchers benefit from text of AV assets, staff tasked with creating descriptions and metadata can benefit from the ability to read or mine a transcript. Relatedly, our institutions at the con as the content publishers benefit from a more robust text-based descriptions made possible, which in turn may result in better search optimization, drive up site traffic, and connect more users to our collections. Many of our workplaces have mission and value statements that prioritize a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Accessibility is an obvious pillar in any DAI effort. Though this not, might not apply to everyone, there are digital library collections out there that publish things like recent lectures, commencements, and events. A greater understanding of creating accessible AV can empower folks responsible for bringing in collections to start conversations with content creators before that content is created. In the same way you might ask those donors for your preferred file format, perhaps you can also start conversations about best practices to enable high quality captions, things like ensuring good quality sound, providing the correct spelling of names, or even a copy of the speech if it exists. And finally, for those of you working in higher ed, this accessibility work presents an opportunity to work more closely with other campus units, such as the accessibility services offices which in turn could open doors for more resources or opportunities for our outreach. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to William Hicks. Thanks everybody for having me. Um, in my time today, I'm going to provide some examples of various scenarios you're likely to run into if you work in a higher ed library, archive or other similar organization. I'll then move into a 20,000 foot view of applicable laws and the web standards which govern how we should be addressing AV. And I'll finish out with real world examples for you to chew on. So let's start with interviews. Interviews with no action are probably very common in your collections, but often you don't just have one person talking under ideal conditions. And sometimes there's information conveyed beyond spoken text. Um, it's these other attributes that can put extra demand on both you, the provider, and your audience. Things like how many speakers are there, or are they in a controlled, well-miked setting, or does ambient noise make it hard to hear and transcribe? Do speakers have impeccable diction or talk rapidly with heavy accents? Is there foreign language content, or do they speak with slang? Or are there expressions of emotion and other affect present for which there is no words. Within the university, you likely have archived lectures. Many of the previous points apply, but now speakers often have projected slides to which they hand wave and assume everyone can see. And you will no doubt find less than optimal microphone or camera placement or complex demonstrations and dense vocabulary. None of the original audience may have needed accommodations, but once posted online, this may no longer be the case. For some, you likely digitize historic media from various providers. While the footage may or may not be easily transcribed, all sorts of unexpected problems can crop up which can affect someone's ability to perceive that content. Imagine yourself with partial vision or hearing loss in encountering degraded media with poor visual contrast or color or audio quality or sound in only one audio channel or no sound at all. Although it's easy to think accessibility is only about hearing and visual impairments, for the Americans with Disabilities Act, the definition is far more expansive, covering mental impairments that affect day-to-day -day activities. So talk to your ODA, ODA office and you'll likely find that your university is accommodating far more users with needs in this category than many others. So then what are the implications for you if you host certain content that is triggering in some way? Do you have content that contains bursts of flashing or strobing effects? Probably rare in most of our contexts, but this is the sort of content that can trigger all sorts of negative effects in some people like seizures or nausea. And though adjacent to accessibility concerns, a reminder that some people make viewing decisions regarding broadcast media based on content advisories of all sorts, and still others are subject to cultural prohibitions that you might want to acknowledge in your content if it warrants it. 
Finally, if your collection contains performance art, you will likely run into the problem of physical action that is never spoken and thus not captionable and difficult to caption song lyrics in a half dozen different languages. You may find speakers and singers in crosstalk or hour plus long band concerts with no text at all, multiple works and no way to skip through a single long trackless file. And so this is a good place to re-emphasize the point that making media accessible isn't just about meeting the needs of hearing impaired audiences, it's about making content more universally available to everybody to the best of their ability. So now I'm going to talk, take a couple of slides to burn through US and Texas law. I'm not a lawyer, so chat with your own counsel for questions. Sections 504 and 508 of the 1973 Rehabilitation Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act are the main laws of concern for most of you. In a nutshell, Section 504 requires those of us receiving federal funds to provide disabled individuals an equitable opportunity to participate in programs and services, but it doesn't deep dive into how one makes specific fixes. For Section 504, you are accommodating or reacting. A user makes a request and you address it. With regards to web content, as part of a 2017 regulatory ref refresh of Section 508, a specific set of standards was put forth to follow. The W3C's WCAG 2.0, which I'll talk about in a moment. An important point to note, under 508 rules, you are being proactive and not reactive in your work. Accessibility is done before content is publicly available. The ADA covers state-provided services and places of public accommodation and in short requires us to provide disability-related services in an integrated manner wherever possible and to provide auxiliary aids so long as they are not a burden or substantially alter our services. Finally, if you archive commercially broadcast media from a TV network, then I suggest you read up on the CVAA, which might be applicable to, applicable to you as well. The service provider 3Play Media has put out a, good, uh, a number of good white papers on these three laws, which I've linked in the QR code and in chat. So court decisions. These inevitably end up favoring the plaintiff and stipulate that universities meet WCAG's middle level of compliance, AA. A recent example of this is the National Association for the Deaf v. Harvard and MIT, where the universities consented to caption all new AV content they produced using a high quality service and to do so for legacy content on request. They were to do so for materials hosted on their servers and included university sponsored student organizations and for content they created and posted on third party platforms like YouTube or Vimeo. Machine transcripts were deemed not acceptable. And there's a couple of relevant links in chat. Um, regarding the Lone Star State, on screen are excerpts from Texas state law and I'll just read the first. Effective April, 2020, all new or changed web pages must comply with WCAG 2.0, level AA, excluding guidelines 1.2, time-based media, so AV. It goes on, based on a request for accommodations for video productions, which support the institution of higher education's mission, each institution of higher education must consider caption, captions and alternative forms of accommodation for video posted on state websites. So I would read the lay of the land as, yes, you need to be doing this work, but the timing of when you do it is a little squishy. Section 504 and state law would dictate on request, whereas section 508, the ADA, and many consent decrees suggest right away and that the institution have a plan for dealing with older materials. So make of this what you will regarding that newly acquired archival collection from 20 years ago. One final nod to a couple of other legal issues to watch out for. First, if you need to send video files to a third party server to process transcripts or to live permanently, and those files contain the faces of currently enrolled students or personal identifiers, your compliance office will likely flag it with FERPA concerns. Think also if you have HIPAA type content or IRB rules, if those apply to your content. 
If your media contains copyrighted materials, you should consider if that's going to be problematic. Uh, the ruling in Authors Guild versus Hattie Trust would suggest it's probably not a concern, but again, talk to your own counsel. And finally, for those of us in Texas, you should all be aware of the new Tex Ramps security certification process, which, which adds additional hurdles for using cloud hosted services. At present, the list of approved providers is somewhat limited. So WCAG is the big set of web standards we're supposed to be, be adhering to. It's segmented, segmented into a giant outline and for each area of accessibility that is addressed, there's a three tiered level of compliance. A, a minimum threshold, double A, the level we need to meet and triple A, a very high cost prohibitive level. I'll walk through the most relevant parts of the spec with some examples over the next few slides and just know that as I progress, things might start to look really scary for some of you quite quickly. Just remember that a lot of us are in the same boat and you likely can do a lot of good with whatever resources you actually have on hand. If you have more questions about any one of these elements, the W3C has a good primer that you should review, which is linked in chat and community notes. So section 1.2, time-based media is where most of the action is. The first part, 1.2.1, says if the content is audio only, you need to have an equivalent for audiences who can't hear the sound. In the example shown on the screen, there is an audio player and on the same HTML screen, a text transcript equivalent is referenced for the user to read. Section 1.2.1 continues. If the content is video with no sound, you should provide some sort of non-visual equivalent either a descriptive text or a recorded audio version. So to illustrate, the video to the left is silent, but a script has been provided that was originally read alongside the film. In the video clip on the right, we have another silent film, but here a, descript a descriptive has been created with a narrator speaking aloud the action that appears on screen. So let's listen to a couple of seconds of that. A sign reads, Louisville Lake Park. Men walk in a field. One pulls a damaged coffee pot out of the trunk of a car. So very descriptive. 1.2.2 requires that there be closed captioning features for pre-recorded media that combines audio and video. And this is the primary means of accessible remediation most of you will recognize and that I'll swing back to shortly with more information. And Daniel has lots of good info for you on the cost and creation workflows you can expect for standard English services here. 1.2.3 is mainly geared towards blind users and concerns video with relevant visual information that isn't verbalized. You could meet this requirement by providing a screenplay or other document that described visual actions in the video recording but for most of us, this standard gets supplanted by a more rigorous one we'll see in a moment. With 1.2.4, the video provider needs to be captioning live video in addition to pre recorded media. 1.2.5 and 1.27 are again for blind users, except our screenplay from earlier is no longer good enough. In order to meet these, you need to inject audio descriptions into the natural pauses and breaks in speech and sound that appear in your video recording. What's an audio description, you ask? I'm gonna play you a quick demo of one created for the Frozen trailer. Note how the narrator reads text that appears on screen and describes unspoken action. From the creators of Tangled and Wreck-It Ralph, Disney. A carrot-nosed coaline snowman shuffles up to a purple flower peeping out of deep snow. Ooh, hello. <laughs> he takes a deep sniff. So, if that freaks you out a little freaks you out a little bit, that's totally understandable. But realize that almost no one is doing this in actual practice in the educational space or most government spaces that I can tell. It's much more common in entertainment video and live theatrical venues but it is repeatedly noted in regulatory text as a double A requirement. Uh, a handful of service providers offer these as a service, 
but you should expect to pay somewhere on the range of nine to fifteen dollars per minute at a minimum for it. But again, if you have media where it's just people in dialogue and there's no action, then this isn't something you need to worry about. If you're interested in sign language as a potential fix for accessibility problems, that is covered under 1.2.6. It is a level AAA, nice to have, but not required by law or regulation. ASL interpretation could be provided as a picture-in-picture -picture window or as a derivative file. Based on my own tests with a service provider, your lowest cost method of doing this is during original production rather than trying to do it in post, but you could probably safely assume that a range cost is going to be somewhere in the range of $50 to $150 per hour for the interpretation and then whatever your production costs are. I'm going to finish this section on the WCAG standard with a note that there are a handful of other guidelines beyond the ones I've identified. Some deal with issues like colorblindness or are intended to prevent seizures. An interesting one you can test on your own site today is being demoed in the video playing on the slide. After we're done, check the keyboard accessibility of the AV player on your own site. Try using it without a mouse, using only the tab or enter keys, arrows, and spacebar. If possible, find an item you have captioned and see if your player has user adjustable settings for things like captions, font size, or color, or settings to aid users with cognitive or learning needs that allow them to slow down the playback speed. We can advance. In this, my last section, I'm going to provide some nuanced talk about text based accessibility practice since it's the area most of you will address. Daniel is going to talk about specific workflows and costs shortly, but I want to show you that the impact can be pretty far reaching and flush out differences between some overlapping concepts. One of the easiest things you can do is comb through your AV materials and describe them in their metadata records so audiences understand the potential problems they may face. Many of the outlying issues I talked about can be addressed in this way at a nominal cost. You can tell the user things like the content is silent or it contains flashing and strobing effects, or you can describe broad visual thematic elements or warn them of potentially harmful materials that they may encounter. Turning to full text, transcripts are a low overhead content remediation you can attempt because you aren't worrying about time aligning to the original media. The output is a document of some sort that can be edited for clarity if appropriate. For sound recordings, this lets you meet WCAG requirements, but for video with sound, it's not enough. The concepts behind subtitles and captions overlap a lot, but the difference is important. Both are time aligned and reproduce spoken text from the source media. Both are typically created and saved in your system using the same file type, a VTT or SRT file, and if indexed, increase searchability. Subtitles, however, are primarily meant for audiences who can hear audio cues like speaker changes and sound effects, or they deliver foreign language trans translations of spoken text. Captions, on the other hand, add contextual information like speaker IDs and sound atmospherics for hearing impaired users, and it is captions and not subtitles that are required by WCAG and by extension law. Daniel is covering workflows and costs for English captioning, but if you're one of the lucky ones with foreign language content, a quick note that transcribing it in the original language or transla translating it to English, English isn't required unless it was FCC regulated broadcast media originally, though it does improve access for non-native speakers. In best practice, however, to identify changes in language when they occur if you stick only with English. Service providers cost and available languages vary widely for foreign language content, but you can expect to pay anywhere from four to $30 per minute. Um, three final examples for giggles. Chapter markers are not a WCAG requirement, but are built with the same file types and provide added benefit for most everybody. Deep linking into a concert recording with multiple work performed in a single long file 
is a good use case for these, but they can be helpful for long lectures and other just really long recordings as well. It's also possible to store time-aligned metadata in these types of files as well. Doing so isn't required anywhere, but the applications can be interesting. In the video example shown, a drone flies around Presidio La Bahai, and its flight and video data have been logged into a VTT file. You can, in fact, store arbitrary data in these types of files, and a programmer can be enlisted to build applications of all sorts, overlaying maps or links or other information to the interface. Finally, you can use VTTs to deliver a text-based audio description nowadays. Traditionally, creating AD content required a derivative copy built in a tool like Adobe Premiere Pro, merging the original audio and new audio tracks, but this has all sorts of production and storage pitfalls, as you can imagine. Doing it instead as a time-aligned plain text has obvious upsides. It can be read using standard caption displays or text-to-speech software as a voiceover. It is editable and it doesn't require multiple derivations in your repository. There's a link in chat that shows some examples of what this looks and sounds like. And so that's my time. Up next is Daniel. All right, thank you very much, Will and Emily. So I'm gonna take the next 15 minutes to provide a high level overview of the practical tools and approaches to consider if you choose to create captions and or transcripts for your AV collection. First, a disclaimer about my perspective and experience. I help manage a dedicated captioning service here at UT Austin. So what I'll discuss is bias towards a higher education context and also captioning and transcription of pre-recorded materials. We'll do our best to get through three main categories of potential approaches that can be standalone solutions or mixed and matched together. I'll lay out options for practical steps to get started, and we'll also weigh potential pros and cons of each approach. So the topics we'll cover are, one, using captioning service providers or third-party companies, internal production, meaning you or your team do the work internally, and we'll go over automated or speech-to-text systems. Uh, the captioning and services uh, captioning and transcription services industry is robust, and there are quite a few companies to choose from. You can, you can find providers who are local and boutique style with a small roster of captioners and transcriptionists, and others have a large pool of distributed freelancers who do the work. Here are some pros and cons of using a service provider for captioning work. Pros, you can scale. You can offload large amounts of content to a company and let them worry about how to get it done. You send them your AV files and they deliver captions back to you and then you pay. So the, the complexity is low. Cost. I'm listing costs as a potential pro as it can be negotiated and reduced, especially with volume discounts or prepayment arrangements. And many service providers offer multiple types of services beyond captioning, um, such as audio description, multi-language translation, live captions, and a combination of human and automated services. The cons are that you might have less control over the quality and on who, who and how the work is done or who does the work and how it's done. Um, the workflows are inflexible, meaning that you submit the content and you are forced to conform to the submission process of the company that you choose to work with, which may mean more manual work on your end. And prices and services may change. Um, there's no guarantee that the prices or services will remain consistent unless you enter into a long-term contract. Uh, one company that we work with has increased their price, I think twice just this year. And a con is that it can also be um, more expensive than internal production. So if you decide to go with a service provider model, how do you choose one to work with? There is a list that's provided from, by the Described and Captioned Media Program, the DCMP, and it has almost 200 providers. 
and this the link to that list will be provided at the notes doc. Some of the more recognizable names are listed here at the bottom of the slide, but the vendor landscape tends to change year to year. Um, I recommend reaching out to colleagues or other contacts who manage similar types of content and also to check if your institution has an established relationship in place already, which can save time and energy um, going through the setup process. Okay, cost. Um, most companies charge a fee by minute or hour video, as William mentioned. So, uh, for example, a 60 minute long video to caption at a dollar a minute would cost $60. Um, but the average cost is about two to three dollars uh, a minute for captioning or transcription. And a low price per minute is, is great, but there are other factors to keep in mind when making your selection. Um, because of the complexity of choosing the right provider for your needs, I've actually put together a cheat sheet that um, is linked in the notes doc. It's a detailed list of questions or criteria to explore when selecting a provider. Um, but I'll highlight a few of the more important ones here. So the setup process, this can be a big gotcha. Some vendors allow you to pay with a credit card um, upfront as you go, so you can just submit files as needed. Others require a written agreement, and this sort of exploratory process can trigger needing approvals um, or even uh, an RFP where you do a request for proposals from multiple vendors. So you need to plan in um, a few weeks or even a few months of onboarding processes. Um, institutional compliance, part of this onboarding process might um, involve considerations, like William mentioned, the text ramp certification process, um, and your own IT governance groups might um, require other checks and balances before you are able to work with a vendor or a company. Um, managing the account, who will manage your account with the provider if you're the sole login, um, or do they provide multiple logins and allow multiple users to submit requests? And if they do, do they have permission schemes where you can control, have finer control over um, who can submit requests? And then finally, payments, how will they work if it's uh, prepay or pay as you go or monthly arrangements? These are just um, questions to ask. And a few more considerations. Um, do you have recourse if the quality of the deliverable drops? So if the captions are less accurate, um, how is the customer service in general? Especially if you have questions about specific orders, who can you contact? And will you have the ability to submit and track orders via an API? Meaning that the service provider system opens up communication with your own internal systems. Um, which can save a lot of manual time and effort. Overall, consider the content and how you would ideally like to submit orders and receive the deliverables. Um, what is the most cost effective, of course, but what is also a sustainable workflow for you and your team, especially considering the potential for increases and in how much content will need to be processed? Um, there are many providers eager to work with you. Just consider, um, I would recommend considering a trial run um, and maybe a small amount of files and see how it goes. Okay, so I'm gonna switch over to the second approach here, which is um, internal production. Here at UT Austin, we actually rely heavily on our student staff to carry the load with in-house production workflows, meaning our student staff actually type out and edit captions and transcripts by hand on a computer. Um, here are, in my opinion, are some of the pros and cons of this approach. The pros, um, with a good team, it can often save cost, especially if you um, can take advantage of work study or other cost saving arrangements, maybe even volunteers. Um, you can control the outcome more easily. Uh, you can customize your workflows to match repository or other system specifics and can more easily pivot if a system or repository changes. Um, it's nice to support local staff like students, and they tend to have a better grasp of domain specific terminology. Um, some of the cons, it takes time to train, to hire and to manage the administrative overhead. 
and it may cost um, money up some upfront um, costs to buy the tools and systems that allow you to do the work, although there are many good free tools out there. And it can be hard to scale, um, especially quickly since you have to hire and train. Um, okay, so I'm um, gonna go over three sort of subtopics here with regards to internal production. Um, and that is some tips for gathering a team, for choosing tools and some best practices for doing the actual work. So gathering a team, uh, this is pretty straightforward, but um, when hiring, um, look for the obvious skill of strong language comprehension and writing, but also look for soft skills, skills like attention to detail and an openness to independent work that can be described as tedious or repetitive. Fluency in multiple languages is a bonus if you deal with non-English material. Um, as a selling point um, when recruiting, stress the impact of the work um, in-house captioners will help increase access, provide a valuable service to the community and may learn something in the process. Again, I recommend giving a potential recruit a short video or audio file to work on so you get a sense of their work, but also so they get a hands-on experience to see if it's a good fit. Uh, average work rate is about 10 to 15 minutes of transcription or captioning per hour of work. So, but this is heavily impacted by the type of content. Um, you know, for example, someone who's speaking very quickly, it'll take longer to, to caption that than someone who speaks slowly and clearly. Okay, so uh, this is another sort of complex topic. Um, I'm just gonna gloss over some higher level questions to ask, um, but there's another cheat sheet that's available for, for this type of work, um, also included in the notes doc. Um, so choosing a tool set for your unique needs and workflows will depend on many different factors. Um, each of these questions can be an entry point to doing some of your own research. Um, it's just a little bit too much information to cover in our short time, but I would definitely be happy to speak to anyone um, about specific apps or systems with these questions in mind. Anything go on? Yeah. Okay, so um, converting audio information in a video to text means making some decisions about what to include and what to leave out, um, especially if you're closed captioning, it's almost a, like a shorthand separate language. You have to strike a balance between not including so much detail that a reader won't be able to keep up with the rate at which the text is displayed, but also ensuring you include important information that might affect the core meaning of the content. And you want to avoid imposing editorial decisions um, as much as possible. So this is an example of a, a music cue that's sort of interpreted in two different ways. Um, the top one being a little bit more objective and the bottom one with a little personal bias maybe. Um, there is not a definitive standard when it comes to specifics like um, speaker identification, atmospheric, atmospherics, um, nonverbal information. So um, basically this is kind of the practical application of what Will brought up um, earlier in regards to your unique content set, you, you will know the content best or your team will. So you need to decide how to handle these particulars. Um, so I recommend creating a style guide that can be referenced by your team. Um, there's a very helpful resource called the captioning key also provided by um, the DCMP. And it's basically a uh, a uh, style guide that, that they've provided that covers most of um, the considerations that are listed here um, and is a good starting point. Okay. You can go to the next slide and can. All right, so this is the last approach and um, we'll go ahead and kind of breeze through this. Um, I'll spend less time on this just because it's a, most of the time it's not a standalone solution. 
but it is very interesting. Um, but first, what is automated captioning or transcription? Um, sometimes it's referred to as ASR, or automatic speech recognition, similar to OCR. Basically, a computer program interprets the audio or video, audio of a video or an audio file and converts it to text. Uh, most systems only capture spoken dialogue and most systems use AI or some sort of machine learning to improve accuracy by learning from large data sets of audio. And some systems allow user input to help improve accuracy, like a vocabulary list. There are systems and tools that process audio um, specifically to create captions and transcripts. Um, Zoom is doing this right now for us in real time. And automated captioning is available as a service from some captioning service providers. Um, and there are some standalone tools, um, software programs. There are um, cloud-based web services like Amazon, Google, all the big ones that have speech-to-text services that are available. And there are some programming languages that have add-on libraries that um, can do it and are free. Um, but do require some coding expertise and effort to get that set up. So we'll go to the next slide. Overall, it's an evolving technology and it's getting better, but um, the accuracy results will vary, as you can see in this example um, of some YouTube automated captions. So the captions above the timeline are the automated captions. And then what was actually said is in red text below there's not a lot of um correlation between the two so um you know there's you have to be cautious when using these okay so some pros and cons um automated captioning can be great because it, it is low cost um and it can be really efficient because they can um, certain systems can process large amounts of data quickly. Um, and it can be especially helpful with um, mixed in with in-house production where um, you perform editing of the, the automated first draft. Um, and I think, um, I still think it's better than nothing. Even at like a low accuracy, like 80%, it's helpful to have some text that's time synced and allows a user to search for key terms and get a general sense of the content. Um, and using it, like I said, for um, as, a, as a first draft for in-house in production workflow is really helpful. This is actually what most of the major captioning service providers do. Um, so cons, uh, you will have to edit and spend time um, doing that. It can be pretty tedious. Um, a computer still can't uh, or isn't set up to interpret speech and other, sorry, uh, yeah. It's not set up to interpret speech and other audio information well enough to rely on for accessibility compliance, as Will mentioned. Um, overall, it can just be another tool in your tool belt and can be very helpful in the right context. Um, I'm definitely looking forward to hearing about how others might be using it in our next webinar. Um, and again, I'd be happy to talk with anyone offline about specific use cases for using any of these workflows we discussed. Um, and I think that's all I have. We have two minutes left, so I'll just go ahead and hand it back over to Courtney to facilitate our Q&A. Thanks. Thank you so, so, so much to all of our speakers. That was awesome. I personally learned so much. Um, if y'all can navigate to your reactions, let's give a little virtual round of applause to our speakers as we gather our questions um, for the discussion period here. That was so good. Thank you so much, all three of you. Um, and also while, um, while you're getting your questions into chat or into the community notes document under questions, um, I will uh, let you know that, again, everyone is invited to join us for the next webinar in our series, Case Studies in Accessible AV. Um, we're going to share a link where you can learn more about that and register for it in chat, and really hope we'll see you there on the 13th. 
Um, we've also included um, in the notes document and here in chat um, a survey where you can complete your AV accessibility institutional profile, which is an opportunity to share some basics about your own AV accessibility programming at your institution with the goal of better communication and collaboration in the Texas region. Um, TDL's AV accessibility webinar series is foundational towards finding ways we can share resources and expertise to improve our AV accessibility procedures um, and tools in this region. And these profiles are going to help us find points of connection and collaboration. Um, this information will be shared on the TDL public wiki for AV accessibility and the speakers and planners for the next webinar might reach out to you um, if you uh, have some information that you provide in your profile that they might ask you to share um, in that next webinar coming up in April. So do we have any questions yet? Let's see. Oh, great. I see one uh, from, I think Susan Kung is the first. Yes, uh, for William Hicks. Um, when you said that the requirement for closed captions only applies to English language content, which requirement were you talking about? Um, so this is going to be with like uh, the WCAG standard for captionings, it's 1.2. I want to say, I forget the number, one or two or five, somewhere between 1.2.1 and 1.2.5, somewhere in there. Um, the WCAG standard doesn't specifically talk about um, languages, English language content, if you have to do it or not. Um, my knowledge is the only time you need to be doing uh, foreign language content is if it is governed by the CVAA, if you're in the United States, which um, is uh, regulated by the FCC and basically says that if it was broadcast um, on network television with captions, that those captions have to appear online within 24 hours or so uh, of it being put online. Um, that law is basically pushed towards providers or like, so it's kind of, questionable if that applies to us in libraries or to the original media producers, but then licensing and all gets kind of weird with like once we take on these collections, like who owns these things? I mean, I don't know. Um, there is a case to be said, I think there is a provision in the one of the like non-accessibility but original civil rights laws that um, users have a right to government publications in their language that they speak. So if you are providing government related videos, then you should be putting those into the language that they uh, translating them uh, in the language they are, but there's no specific WCAG standard about the language that it's in. It's just a sort of a nicety that if you can afford it and you wanna do it, go ahead. It, it adds the ability for everyone to be able to um, understand that media if possible. I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much. And thanks for that question, Susan. I want to add to before we go to the next question that if you'd like to raise your hand um, and, and ask your question uh, unmiked instead of typing it, you are also welcome to do that. Um, and we'll keep an eye out for your hands. Um, I have a question from TDL's own Elliot Williams, our DPLA outreach, outreach coordinator, um, who asks, do any of you take different approaches for different types of content? For example, do in-house transcription for your oral, oral histories, but then outsource transcription for theater production, for example? I did want to mention that actually, um, not only different approaches um, for different types of content, which um, we tend to get a lot of course recordings, uh, so lecture lectures, and some have a very quick turnaround because there may be a deaf or hard of hearing student enrolled in the class. And so they might get ASL interpreting in class or if it's a live class but then want to have captions available to rewatch the recording. So for those, we often use internal um, student workers workflows because we can just we can split out a long video and get it done really quickly. Um, but we also work with multiple 
companies, multiple service providers, because some are just better suited for um, different types of content. Some are just less expensive and have, um, but may have longer turnaround periods. So, you know, if something isn't urgent, we can um, use that particular company at a lower cost and just plan in some extra time. Where others are really good about getting stuff done quickly. And again, others provide different types of services like translation. Um, so yes to that question, that's a good. Good question. And Emily and Will, do you have examples? Um, I'll chime in and say that um, we will tend to vendor out more of the content that is um, provided by campus institutions that we are working with um, for like fast accuracy rate. We've only been experimenting with students editing. Um, content only in the last few months. So we don't have a lot of experience with that, but we do, we did a, a large project using um, AI generated transcripts from a vendor. And we did that on a very like large collection number of hours of content and basically treated it as a um, triage type situation where we're trying to do like get something up. And so it was um, a better than nothing type of, uh, of idea to go with that. Um, and I will say also just as a follow up on the like foreign language content, definitely we've had a hard time. Um, I, 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 it's hard to hire anyone who can speak various foreign languages, hard enough to find someone to do Spanish, um, let alone, you know, Polish or any of these other languages that you might have content in. Um, and that if you are looking for content that is in a foreign language, um, I've only worked with one provider that does uh, multiple foreign languages. And one thing that was really interesting to note is that the directionality of that content translation is not always bi-directional. They are much better at translating from English to Bulgarian or Spanish or whatever, and rarely will go like original Russian to English or things like that. Um, so that's a thing to look out for. And then for music and stuff like that, you, you wanna have like music students working on it or, or whatnot. Emily, did you want to add anything for that question? Um, well, I would say I think our operations are far less robust than um, my co-presenters. So um, right now we're we have a grant, um, and we are doing like, and it's all based on on finances. So we're doing one subsection where we're using like really high quality vendor created, like human vendor created uh captions, and those are just the materials. You know, we have enough money to do maybe seven hundred hours of the several thousand hours of content. And so those 700 hours are just the um, items that we suspect are the most complex, you know, those with like the most crosstalk and the most um, background noise and all those like complicating factors. And for the rest of the collection, just based on, on finances, we're just having to do kind of like AI generated with some in-house cleanup. So, um, but like I said, we're, our scale is much smaller, I think, than, than my colleagues. Thank you all for providing those uh, those great answers. Our next question is from Lauren Goodley, um, and she's asking about the amount of time that it typically takes students or in-house folks to do transcription. Um, I think it was mentioned briefly on a slide, but if you could just revisit that. Sure, um, and it, yeah, it, it definitely varies quite a bit, but on average about 10 to 15 minutes of uh, video time captioned for every roughly hour of work time. Um, and it, yeah, it can definitely be much lower. Um, and I think maybe 15 minutes is on the higher end if someone's really cranking. Thanks, Daniel. I, I heard that and then I thought I think I must have misheard it because I've always <clears throat> heard it uh, done uh, calculated the other way, like eight or Eight, eight or 10 times the time. Mm. And I, I'm trying to do the math in my head and it's probably the same. But anyways, I just heard 15 minutes and I was like, what? You need more than that. So I tried to catch you, but it was just different math. So <laughs> thanks for clarifying. Yeah, no problem. 
Our, uh, thanks. And also, Lauren, thank you for demonstrating that we really like it when you jump in and talk to us. Um, <laughs> so feel free. Uh, next question here is for Daniel. Um, have you developed or do you follow a specific style guide for the captions yourself? And do you provide quality control for some or all of the captions? Or how do you deal with that quality control generally? Yes, we, we have um, developed a style guide that um, it's almost uh, content specific and that we have we we work on like i said a lot of course materials so it's it's pretty specific to that and a lot of um i mean all different types of subjects we have almost like a style guide for math uh videos or like stem content um and and then uh, a big list of names of like professors and tas and stuff like that so we we've definitely developed that um and then uh, we do have quality control reviews on everything that is created either by our students internally or that's even del um, delivered and created by a service provider. Um, it's sort of, a, uh, we do a spot check and based on maybe the first few minutes, um, make some decisions around how how thoroughly to check the the rest of the, the video. Um, so yes, definitely that seems to be um, necessary just to, to make sure we it's a, it's of high quality, especially for our, our course materials where there's a student that may be depending on those to to for the for the course. I just want to pause for a second and see if uh, Will or Emily um, wanted to add to that answer at all before we move on. I can't see your faces, so let me know. I don't have just anything to add. Real quick clarification, just, you know, so we're, I run a capturing service that's centrally funded by the university. So we deal with uh, library collections materials, but I'd say most of what we deal with is actually is our course materials. So, you know, doing review processes like that, um, you know, we're, it's sort of built into our funding model um, so that's just something to consider. It's a little different than most of the other use cases. I will add just one thing actually. During um, when campus was closed and, and we at UH were able to do a, a pretty large um, captioning project, we did have like kind of a two tier system where we had, we did it where we had like the automatically generated transcripts um, from a very, very cheap and not very high quality um, automated service. And then we had one group of correctors and then we had a team of QCers and the team of QCers were also the ones that did the time alignment um, because there were some like pretty big timing issues, which um, I had hoped that that would be a little bit more high quality with the AI generated service, but they were um, they were like not great. So that was how we approached it was with the like, the first set really only did the content and the second QC's group did the alignment process. Thank you so much. And thanks again, everyone asking these great questions. Um, next up is um, for all of you again, do you have examples of possible grant funding sources for transcribing and captioning of collection content? Um, I just came off the end of TSLAC grant the last couple of years. Um, so they will fund uh, doing transcripts and captions. Um, yeah, just make a proposal every March. And I'm currently um, in the midst of a NEH grant. Um, and the grant isn't just for the transcription process, but we wrote it into the grant. So ours is um, like 40 years of, of radio that, that were digi we digitized everything as part of the project and then also did, paid for the transcription services. But I have to say, like I um, underestimated the costs because it really, it's, um, it's really astronomical. So I just encourage anyone uh, writing those grants to really put a lot of money towards that part of it. That's why we're having the automated for, for a section of our content. And just because um, someone, 
someone did ask in chat about what is TSLAC, and so I just want to clarify that's the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. It feels like these conversations always come around to funding, which is a little bit of an issue, but I'm glad we're still talking and I'm glad, Mark, that um, every, everybody does what the portal does. So I'm happy that you're um, you're on that. I think it was Daniel that you said that you're um, run a captioning department within the university. So can you explain how that works like you do class materials, but then you'll also do materials from the archives upon request. And is there, I don't know if you can get into payment from those departments, but if you can, I would be curious. Yeah, we, it's pretty simple. I mean, we, uh, the university essentially covers the cost of any captioning or transcription related to course materials and then any specific accessibility requests. Um, so ADA accommodation request for deaf or hard of hearing. And then we, so like, um, and then working on other types of content, we just kind of do like a chargeback um, method where we charge the requesting department to do the work. And we try to keep our price points really low. It's sort of like a subsidized service. Yeah, it's, that was my first thought, like that we use Rev because we have a lot of stuff and it's easy and it's just feels really expensive to do in-house. But if you already have that infrastructure, you know, yourself anyways, that that's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. I have another question, um, which uh, really speaks my language. Uh, are there dig digital preservation concerns around preserving accessibility files? I think that it's, I mean, the VTT files are pretty easy to store and pretty tiny. So if you are concerned, I think it's pretty, pretty simple to keep those. Um, I do think one interesting thing is someone who has like a broadcast collection is like uh, capturing those lines of video code that have the caption if it was captioned when it was originally broadcast and that doesn't always happen so like that's like a conversation between you and um if you're using a vendor to digitize your content or how you're getting that those lines of of code captured uh, it's really important okay hearing no other takes on that i'm going to move on to the next um, question here um, in just a sec, but I do want to note, just in case any of you missed it, on the funding question, uh, Mark Phillips mentioned in chat uh, that they're trying um, to get digitization projects to include captioning as part of the initial proposals. I think that's really wise, um, a wise effort and great advice. So the next question here is for William. Um, at the start of your presentation, you mentioned regulations that could apply to potentially triggering content. Um, would you mind talking a little more about that and what types of content that might apply to you? Um, the example given here is um, this person has several human rights um, related collections that document the aftermath of violent acts. Sure. So um, again, being not a lawyer, I can't give you like great advice or information, but um, the Americans with Disabilities Act um, covers both physical and mental impairments. Um, most of these laws don't really have sections talking about how you fix things. It's always someone sues someone and then a, law, a judge says, this is how you should address it. And in almost all cases so far, it's all been um, representatives of the deaf community for the most part. Um, and that's why there's so many caption related um, settlements out there. Um, when it comes to like triggering content, I think it's just a one of those do you like you should think about doing your best uh, job or effort that you can. This was a very controversial issue, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, but the I I think it's just if you can just making a note of this content potentially has issues for some users, 
I think that probably covers your basis. Um, but again, you don't really know until like someone makes a complaint and sues someone. So there's there's just no real good advice that I can give you that that will cover you completely. And I just want to give Teresa the opportunity. Is there anything else that you want to add? Um, or is that that cover your question? Oh, great. I see. Thank you. I see in chat that you're good. <laughs> um, so Jeffrey, uh, sorry to make you wait there, um, but uh, we'd love to hear your question. Uh, yes, no problem. Uh, thank you. The um, I just wanted to add a little bit about what I know about preserving uh, these uh, extra documents that you create that go along with the AV files and stuff like that. What we've experienced, what I've experienced in the examples that I saw from uh, William's presentation, they're basically all text files. So they're very future proof in that way. The only thing that uh, changes from medium to medium is um, even though it's a text file, it may have a encoding in the front of each piece, which tells where the timestamp is. But it's a text file, so it doesn't. It can be very easily manipulated in the future, if the standards do change. It will be able to. Uh, future, it's future proofed in that way, and that it doesn't require a very specialized reader to get to them. I hope that helps with the explanation. Thank you so much. That's very much appreciated. And I saw a bit of a, I've lost track of a bit of a conversation that was happening in the chat here um, with Lauren and, and Daniel. Could one of you update us on that? Um, it's easier probably for you to do that than me to go sure. back to the chat here. I, I just basically said what uh, Jeffrey pointed out and that VTT files and other um, text-based caption files are, are just, just that, they're text and they're very easy to convert. Um, to different types of formats if if they become obsolete. So I just agreed with him. Yep. Awesome. So we still have about nine minutes left, folks. So please keep those questions coming. Um, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, just a reminder that we will put everything in the community notes doc all the links um, and we've included several of these questions and in many cases um, some of you have actually contributed some of uh, the answers in summary form we really appreciate that thank you very much y'all um, and also just a reminder again that we do have that survey for you it's very short i promise i know people like to hear that about surveys um, and it's very true this is a very short institutional profile um, that will really just help us find better ways to collaborate in the region so please do take some time to do that and definitely um, if if you liked today's set of presentations then you're probably going to like the next set on the 13th so please do register for that as well um, and also, I'm just going to take this opportunity with eight minutes remaining to thank all of you, especially our speakers today. My goodness, this was so fantastic. Um, and we just really appreciate your participation and your questions. And as Leah mentioned, we will be captioning this recording. Um, well, we won't. We will be using um, the capable team <laughs> at UT. Um, and the notes and the slides are also going to be available as soon as we can. Um, now I'm seeing here, there's more conversation going on in the Slack, but I don't see, I see one question. Um, Mark or Cindy, would you mind sharing um, what's going on in the chat there? <laughs> Sorry about that. I have to cough when I unmute. Um, so I think there was just questions on, um, you know what what form so that with with um time-based captions there are a ton of different formats that are um, either legacy formats or other competing formats in this space and um kind of the question was whether or not we um you know see a lot of longevity in the web vtt format and i was just saying that at least from our perspective it's probably about as, as stable as we're going to get for these kinds of format formats um it's a w3c standard there's a lot of um industry behind it there's a lot of support from that um 
stepping back, these are really simple formats in the grand scheme of the world. Like um, they're, they're pretty easy to move between one and two. So it, it's, it shouldn't be like the same kinds of questions of like the hand wringing around like compression algorithms and JPEG 2000, blah, blah, blah. It's like, which one works the best? Um, SRT and WebVTT are so similar that most people won't notice the difference. There are differences, um, but many of these, it's there are converters that go back and forth and back and forth, and you can round trip completely. Um, for us, we were we didn't have any legacy content that wasn't WebVTT, so we were able to start fresh and say from this point on WebVTT, and um, so far we haven't really run into issues with that. Um, but the moment I say that, we'll probably hit something that doesn't work and we'll have to reconfigure. But for us, yeah, it's it's probably just fine. Um, and definitely there's pretty straightforward exit strategies in that future event that a new, better time-oriented format that's super straightforward comes out. It looks like we have a follow-up question from Susan Kung. Um, what about videos with burned-in captions? Do they need a time-aligned text-based file to accompany them? Um, so I'll jump in with, so this is the difference between closed captions and open captions. And when it's burned in, it's the open caption style. Um, I think that there are a number of communities that do like the open caption for like movies and, uh, live venues where it's an equity issue. But when you're talking about content that, that we're dealing with, it, just imagine again that like it's a, it's a video feed with no actual text alternative. So if the like text is showing on screen, it's not searchable by Google and it is not able to be read by a text to speech engine in your browser or um, uh, in the operating system. So like it'll do, but like if you have a like a, a deafblind user who can't see the screen, then they can't read the text either. So um, closed captions are probably in our context the best thing that you can do for the most number of users. Thank you so much for clarifying uh, what burned in meant. That would have been my next question had it not been defined. I had not heard that before. So we've got three minutes left, y'all. Probably time for at least one more question if you've got one burning that you would like to ask. Uh, I'm watching for your raised hands and questions in the chat. Any final comments from the um, three presenters? Oh, actually, we'll get to that. Um, Susan's asking, are there screen readers for deafblind users? Um, so I am not like at all an expert in the, the tools that users use beyond just like standard things that are in browsers, but I'm fairly certain that there are screen readers that, I mean, there are screen readers that um, deaf and blind users use, yes. So um, it would read uh, any HTML cap content and I'm somewhat certain that it would read uh, caption text out loud as well, but it just depends on the player probably. Any other final thoughts from our presenters today? Uh, just that if anyone, uh, I think our emails were included in the slide deck and um, uh, personally, if anyone has specific questions um, about what we covered today, I'd be glad to talk with y'all. So feel free to reach out. Emily? Yeah, same. Um, if there's any, any follow up, you know, I think I think all of us are just excited to have these conversations. So I'm glad that they're happening and I hope they continue. Yeah, ditto. And I'm excited to see the next presentation in a couple of weeks, whatever that is. Yeah, this was excellent. Um, the turnout today speaks to how much this was needed. And I want to thank the steering committee. Um, 
our, our, our speakers are definitely part of that steering committee, but there are several other folks involved um, who have worked hard to make this happen and are working hard to make the second webinar happen as well. Um, just thank y'all so much. Um, and with that, I think we're going to close today. Um, if you are still here, folks, feel free to share those clapping reactions one more time for our excellent group today. Um, we are incredibly grateful for your uh, generosity in sharing your expertise with us here at TDL. Um, with that, I'm going to close the session. And thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>